Welcome to uh, the Energy Policy Seminar. I'm uh, Henry Lee. I'm the director of the Environment and Natural Resource Program at the Belfer Center here at the Kennedy School, and one of the sponsors of this seminar series, along with the Mosavat Lamani and the Harvard University Center for the Environment. Uh, this is our first uh, and I believe only hybrid uh, 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 seminar uh, in this series. Uh, we've been trying to do it for the last few weeks, but we finally have pulled it off. Uh, so uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, and there is free food uh, that you can seek out and get here. Um, um, we are recording this seminar uh, and we'll post it on the series webpage. So if you have a friend or colleague, who misses this talk, please let them know that they can watch it later. Uh, we'll have an in-person Q&A uh, for the people in this room, but for our virtual audience, we will take questions through the Q&A function, which is uh, in Zoom, which is at the bottom of your page. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Alexandra Strapassen. Uh, Dr. Strapassen is a research fellow in agriculture and energy policy at the Environment and Natural Resource Program at the Kennedy School, uh, working on bioeconomy and the water uh, energy food nexus. He is also an honorary lecturer at Imperial College in London and a visiting lecturer at IFP School in France. Prior to his experiences, uh, Dr. Strapassen was director and head of the Department of Bioenergy at the Brazil's Ministry of Agriculture. Uh, I will, I could keep on going on all the other things he's involved with, but I will uh, leave him more time to uh, talk about this really interesting new issue, which is sort of biofuels and negative emission technologies. Uh, his doctorate is from Imperial College, and he has been with us, I think, almost three years, different times. So uh, welcome, Alexander. Thank you very much, Henry, for this uh, kind introduction. Hello, everyone. Very good to see you all here. And hello to everybody that's uh, watching online this presentation as well. Uh, for me, it's a great pleasure to be here. I think after five years, it was my last talk here in this school. And I'm very, very happy to be here again. Okay. So my presentation today, I'm going to focus uh, on the negative emissions technology related to Sorry, uh, Alexander, uh, before you get uh, going, could you share your slides for um, just put it in presentation view for the uh, Zoom attendees? I thought it was a Let's see here. Is that okay? No. Let's see here. Oh, okay. Let's try. Yes. Okay, cool. Wonderful. Right, so let's get started. So, right, so uh, uh, first of all, let's talk about the challenge that, that we had. Most of you are very familiar. If you are not very familiar with this course yet, this was the last IPCC report, one of the IPCC reports launched by uh, the working group. Three, uh, which was uh, two weeks ago. And here we can see that uh, the 1.5 uh, degrees Celsius, the curve to meet this 1.5 is going to be extremely challenging. And even the curves to meet 2 degrees Celsius are going to be very challenging as well. The red curve there on top is approximately the trend uh, if we have the uh, implemented policies that uh, countries are pledging to have. And, and on the other graph here, you can see by uh, 2100, 
that actually if we keep this trajectory of 1.5 at some point uh, we are going to meet net zero we have to meet net zero otherwise the temperature will keep increasing 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 uh, and if we are to uh, really obtain this uh, strong reduction we are going to need some source of negative emissions so to achieve net zero we need some sources of negative emissions because there are some sectors that are very hard to abate. <clears throat> so, for example, uh, cement, iron, steel, uh, variable electricity. There are, these are sectors that are very difficult to obtain net zero. So, unless we have some sort of you know direct air capture, you know, uh, increasing soil carbon, this type of thing, it's going to be difficult. But actually, uh, it's uh, the challenge is a bit more complicated than that because even when we meet net zero, we have to achieve net negative. And why we have to achieve net negative? Because what matters is the cumulative emissions. So we have a cumulative emission in the atmosphere. Once you reach net zero, well, the cumulative emissions are still there. So if you want to uh, have uh, the, the, the uh, cumulative emissions back to pre industrial levels, we have to have net negative scenario beyond uh, 2050. Some other colleagues uh, talked about this type of challenge in previous uh, seminar. So I just want to stress this concept of net negative scenario, which is very important. Right. And now we have the reality because the curves, the scenarios, I'm a modeler, and we can model thousands of scenarios. Scenarios that people, everybody will be happy, scenarios that uh, some people will prefer, so this type of thing. But the reality is that actually we are keeping our GHG emissions increasing. Now, we are not being able to decrease these emissions as uh, promised. Uh, as you can see here, the emissions of, from uh, CO2 from fossil, they are quite substantial, 64%. The emissions from land use change are about 11%, uh, and methane also extremely high including livestock, including uh, leakage from natural gas, for example, and other sources like the rice cultivation, for instance. Well, and when we look at the energy sector specifically, we see that uh, in the past 10 years or a bit more, actually the share of fossil fuels remain approximately the same. And the total amount has actually increased the total production of fossil fuels. Uh, in the past 10 years. Although uh, we have to recognize that uh, modern renewables also increase it. But when people look at only at modern renewables, they may think, oh, look, actually, renewable energies are increasing very substantially. Yes, they are increased, but fossil fuels, they are also increased. And many people think that, well, actually, what matters now is solar energy and wind power, and completely forget and deny bioenergy. Perhaps with some type of prejudice about biofuels, that biomass is something from developing nations, this type of, of uh, bad understanding about modern use of biomass that I would like to go over a bit, a bit more here with you. So if you look at this share of modern renewables, you see that biomass is actually part of several sectors, transport sectors, also for heating, also for, for power generation. But the largest share is traditional biomass. The traditional biomass, which is within these others, is <laughs> other like uh, something a bit, uh, many things hidden here. So actually, we have nuclear and traditional biomass. Maybe. So, in total, bioenergy is about 60 exajoules. The total energy demand in the world is 381 exajoules. Only bioenergy is 60 exajoules. So, 16% of the total primary energy consumption is bioenergy. Of course, when you talk about the power sector, then it's different. Of course, wind power and solar, they have been increasing very substantially, which is really great. But primary energy is different because then we include, uh, and, and we talk about not only primary energy, we talk about energy mix as a whole. Then we include transport sector, then we include heating, we include several other processes. And liquid biofuels, which is part of bioenergy, so things like ethanol, biodiesel is just part of bioenergy. Bioenergy is much broader than that. It includes solid biomass like wood pellets, wood chips, you know, logs, and agricultural residues. All these type of sources 
including gases like biogas, for example, are within this goal. But so one important question is how much bioenergy could be obtained without competing with food and forestry conservation? This was one of the questions that I had uh, since I was doing my PhD. I was a bit concerned with this type of thing because you know we could say, oh, actually it's very nice. We plant crops and then we use photosynthesis to capture CO2 and produce a liquid fuel or, or a solid fuel that would be wonderful because this is renewable and we can displace fossil fuel. Yes, but we need land to do that. Because we need land, uh, then we have another problem because then we have the agricultural world involved. In it. So, not the energy only, but agriculture. Then we have potential competition with food reserves and food production, with forestry, this type of thing. So, how to model this uh, in a, a proper manner? So, we have to include different dynamics. For example, crop and livestock yields, they they tend to keep increasing. So if we increase crop and livestock yield, it means that we can produce the same amount with less land. Okay. Uh, although we may also increase food consumption, and we are going to need more of this uh, type of product. So not necessarily crop yields would be sufficient to meet the demand. Okay. But we have also possibilities to change dietary patterns. We have possibilities to increase soil carbon, depending on the agricultural management that we have, we can increase soil carbon. We can use our agricultural residues in a smarter manner. It's also possible to have multiple cropping and integrated systems. This is uh, very often not very well included in the models. Multiple cropping means that, for example, if you have a corn harvest in, in an area that is subtropical or tropical area, actually you can have two crops in a same year. You can have, here, have even a third crop in winter season. So, which means that uh, there is a difference between harvested area and the physical area because if you are harvesting let's say three crops a year actually your harvested area is three times your physical area okay okay and another important point to include uh, is the amount of co-products and byproducts associated with uh, energy production so let's say for example corn which is the most important crop here used for uh, the production of ethanol, for example, in the United States. We produce not only ethanol, but we produce also distilled dried grains with solubles, which are also called DDGS. And DDGS is produced uh, from the other part of the kernel because we use to produce ethanol, we use only the starch part. The other part is, is DDGS, which is used as an animal feed. So lots of models they don't include this in the analysis. They say, oh, look, actually, we are using all this corn to produce biofuel. So we need the same amount of land to produce corn for other things. But actually, we are using only this large part. Okay, so we are, we are still using um, uh, other parts of the kernel to produce corn oil, DDG acids. Sugarcane also has similar dynamics. Sugarcane is the second most important crop used for ethanol production, particularly in Brazil and some other nations. And we obtain ethanol, but we can also produce sugar, we can also produce electricity. Rhinacis is a liquid residue from the biorefinery, which is, can also be used as a source of uh, fertilizers. <clears throat> right, when we put this all together in a system dynamics model, uh, some colleagues and I model these dynamics at global scale and obtain that uh, the 6 exajoules of bioenergy can increase up to 70 in a business as usual without competing with food security. If we put all this variable, changing diet or not changing diet, increasing or uh, crop use or increasing uh, aggressively or little, this type of thing. In a high mitigation scenario, we could increase this to up to 170 exajoules. In an extreme situation, we have this 60. This is consistent with uh, some IPCC uh, results as well. And what I want to show you is that by modeling this, we can see that we can obtain a substantial amount of negative emission by increasing soil carbon and by increasing carbon in reforestation. Because if we increase crop yields, for example, we can have more forests. We can have more forests, we have more carbon storage in the forests. Right. Another uh, uh, possibility to store carbon without using bioenergy. I listed here a number of them. This, for example, to have afforestation, reforestation, as I mentioned, so if you have more 
let's say free that lens. You know, so this, this concept may be a bit confusing. What I mean by free that lens is that, for example, when you increase uh, crop yields, and then you may you may release some areas that you can use for other things. Okay, so this is called free that lens or surplus lens, some kind of surplus. And then you can have either forestation reforestation, or you can have biofuel crops, for example, in some of these areas. But another possibility is to increase soil carbon. So, um, soil carbon can substantially change if you use, for example, if you have a forest, if you have a well managed pasture land, if you have, uh, uh, for example, a no tillage system, uh, when you have, for example, uh, crop uh, corn harvest followed by a soybean harvest, for example, and you plant directly uh, uh, on the straws. You just cut the straws and plant, keep the straws on the soil. So this type of process increases a lot of soil, the amount of soil carbon, the amount of organic material in the soil, which is a way to sequester this, this carbon. Some people may argue, well, this is a way to sequester, but this is a bit complicated because if you have more, you know, if you change land use or if you have a lot of forest, but then we have a large instance of wildfire, this type of thing, then this carbon will be released back to the atmosphere. That's a risk. I, I admit that this is a risk. And, but this doesn't mean that we shouldn't uh, increase this, uh, uh, so we face this type of uh, approach because they can provide substantial negative changes. Well, wood materials, uh, this is uh, relatively small when we compare to global scale emissions, et cetera. For example, wood materials that use for buildings, et cetera. Although in the United States, very common, very common to have uh, wooden houses, but if you calculate all this uh, amount of carbon, it's relatively small to have this as a climate change mitigation strategy, et cetera. Well, another possibility is biochar. Uh, some people here are probably familiar with biochar. If you are not, biochar is basically the production of charcoal. And then you mix this, it's a, it's a kind of charcoal actually, through pyrolysis. And then you uh, obtain a material that is very stable. This carbon is very stable. So we spread this and mix this in the soil, in the agricultural process. It increases uh, nutrient retention, it increases, it ha has many uh, interesting. Uh, uh, characteristics um, uh, biochar uh, and uh, this carbon won't be decomposed easily by soil microbiota. So, which means that you could have this carbon rather than having geological sequestration, you will simply have carbon in soil in a relatively stable manner for centuries. There are lots of research on that if this carbon will be really stable for centuries or not. So, so whole new area uh, biochar research. Well, so um, one important question is that um, rather than just having, you know, biomass sequestering carbon or increasing soil carbon, can we get energy from this and at the same time store carbon? So then we could tackle two issues actually at the same time. Yes, it is possible. Just to clarify here, my emphasis, my emphasis here is on negative emissions. So if you say, oh, I'm using biomass to displace coal, well, this is low carbon, this is not negative. So being negative, then you have to sequester somehow, like biochar, deforestation, or bioenergy with carbon capture and storage, also called as BECS. So this is a very simplified system. So we have here, for example, a reforested land, a commercial forest plantation, let's say eucalyptus or pine trees. And then you harvest this is sequestered carbon from the atmosphere by photosynthesis. You harvest this biomass. You use this biomass, let's say, in a thermal power, but rather than releasing the CO2, you are capturing the CO2 and sequestering here. This process is not only a theoretical thing. There are companies already doing that. One of the companies is Transpower. This is not a propaganda. This is just because they are really being pioneers in this. This area, they are already doing this in the, in the United Kingdom in a very large amount of power there. And um, uh, you can also account here not only for the sequestration, 
but that you are displacing coal. Okay, so you can actually they start the coal firing, so putting biomass pellets with coal in the same furnace, the same boiler, and then started to increase more and more the biomass until displacing almost, almost entirely uh, the use of coal, okay, becoming a uh, biomass power plant. Well, just to uh, recap here some main uh, power cycles, which I would like to emphasize a bit in the next slides. We have basically three possibilities of power generation. There are some other cycles, but uh, just to uh, recap a bit all here, we have single vapor, vapor uh, power cycle, also called as a hunking cycle. This is relatively uh, low to medium efficiency. So basically you get solid stuff like coal, solid biomass, pellet. You put this up to a boiler, uh, heat water. This heated water goes to a steam turbine and then it produces electricity. Um, there are lots of uh, coal thermal power, for example, based on this uh, system, actually most of them are based on this system. And uh, when you use gases, rather than using solid biomass, you can then put this in a gas turbine. In a gas turbine, there's another cycle, there's a driving cycle. You just put the fuel directly in the turbine and then you obtain electricity. Single vapor is about 25% to 40% efficiency. Gas power is around 42% uh, efficiency. And then you can also have a combined system. So you have a gas turbine and then the thermal residue from the gas turbine, you can still put in a steam turbine. So combining these both cycles, then you can maximize a lot of efficiency, obtaining about 50% efficiency. You can also use the thermal residue from all the cycles, which is called combined heat and power. You get thermal residue, for example, for heating water, for an industrial use, or you know, heating houses, for example. So you are no longer able to generate electricity from this delta T of the temperature, but you can, you can use this uh, thermal residue for other purposes. Okay, that said, then we uh, let's keep moving here uh, in this digging deep down on the best approach. So other possibilities are okay, capture CO two, put this here in a thermal power, either single cycle uh, or Combine it cycle. If you gasify the biomass, if you convert the biomass into a gas, we can use, uh, for instance, gas cycle. But we can also, let's say, harvest corn or sugar cane and produce biofuel and use biofuel here. And biofuel in the fermentation process releases CO2. So I get the CO2 here and have sequestration. So in this case, actually, I'm obtaining a liquid fuel there. But I'm on capturing the additions from the fermentation process, which increases a lot the carbon balance. So we can produce liquid fuels basically in three main ways. Um, the most common sources are fermentation of sugars or indirectly fermentation of starch. Starch is a, is a long chain, it's, it's a long carbohydrate. So if, if you split down, uh, break down the molecule of uh, starch, you obtain lots of small sugars that you can ferment. So when you use a starch, like corn or wheat, there are lots of other crops, then after breaking down this molecule through hydrolysis, you obtain more sugar that you ferment, and also after distillation, you produce ethanol as well. Okay, so it's almost the same logic here. Another process is using cellulose and many cellulose. So then you can use almost any type of biomass. The idea here is to break down cellulose and then cellulose, which are very large carbohydrates, and then have to need a pre treatment and hydrolysis, and then you speak into small sugars that you can ferment. This is a bit expensive. This is already, um, some companies are already doing it, but the cost of ethanol fuel is uh, more expensive than the conventional sources. But this is uh, still lots of expectation that this will become more competitive in the coming years. Although this promise has been for a long time and still a little bit of loss there, it's having difficulty to be more competitive. Right, um, there are lots of papers uh, about 
the carbon footprint from ethanol. You can find papers talking very badly. Recently, there is this recent publication uh, criticizing a lot of the maple fuel standard here in the United States. But what I can tell you is that um, you can also find lots of other papers talking the opposite, you know, including in uh, journals like Science and Nature, etc. Okay? So I personally try to uh, look at different papers, see the assumptions, if they're consistent or not, see the historical uh, data, see the trends to see if they make sense or not. Well, uh, the US EPA, for example, they consolidated several studies and obtained different ranges here for net GHG emissions according to different types of fuel. You see here, uh, baseline gasoline is almost 100. And then you have like ethanol here ranging from, you know, depending on the system that you produce, that you produce you have different levels of carbon sequestration. If you are looking for an average number, just to have an idea more, you know, rather than a huge range, that would, that would be more or less uh, a data that would make more sense. I think this study is quite reasonable uh, uh, from Scully and, and colleagues. They published uh, environmental research letters. They obtained about 46% uh, lower emissions than gasoline by using corn ethanol. And for sugar cane, there is also this paper published in Nature Climate Change obtaining 86% reduction. And uh, one of the main reasons for this difference is because in the case of sugar cane in the biorefinery, you use the, bio, the sugar cane by gas as your energy source for the biorefinery. And in a corn biorefinery, we need some, an additional source of energy. And this is usually natural gas. So this natural gas, unfortunately, it damages the carbon footprint from uh, corn. One way to, to uh, get rid of this natural gas is to use biomass. For example, I'm using nat natural gas, you use, let's say, pellets from eucalyptus, for example. And some companies, they are already doing that. So then you can increase even more this uh, benefit. But so, um, but currently, we are using ethanol mainly for road as, as a, a fuel uh, to displace gasoline. So this is mainly a road transport. We use uh, ethanol in autocycle engines. So just to uh, remember that biodiesel is a different story. Okay, biodiesel, we use biodiesel to displace diesel in diesel cycle. For example, trucks, uh, uh, ships, for example, you can use biodiesel or other types of oil about oil based fuels. When you talk about auto cycle, then ethanol is an interesting fuel to displace gas. You can use this in normal cars, for example, having blendings of ethanol with gasoline. In the United States, there are lots of states that have E10, which means 10% ethanol within gasoline. Many consumers, they, they don't know this, actually, but they're having 10% in many fuel pumps. And more recently, there is a big pressure in the, and not pressure, but uh, pressure and support, I would say, to uh, allow the use of E15 uh, throughout the year in the United States. Uh, President Biden was recently in a biorefinery. He supported this idea. There are lots of farmers trying to convince uh, members of the Senate to uh, push this. In this uh, Home Front Energy Security Independence Act to allow this 15% uh, blend, which could increase a bit the use of uh, ethanol, actually substantially the use of ethanol in the US. Although in, in the long term, it's likely that electric vehicles, vehicles will become more and more competitive and will gradually displace these vehicles that are based on combustion systems. But this will take time. And we think on a global scale, this will take much more time than in the United States. We, all, we can also have flex fuel vehicles, which can use different types of 100% ethanol or 100% gasoline, it doesn't matter. Okay. And hybrid vehicles, electric, and then ethanol or flexible, flex fuel, and hybrid. Now, some other research, they are trying to have some colleagues working on this at the University of Campinas in Brazil. They are trying to get hydrogen from the ethanol molecule, take the hydrogen from the ethanol molecule within the, the vehicle, so have a reform within the vehicle, so just fill, fill up your tank with ethanol, 
And these reformers take the hydrogen off of ethanol and put in a fuel cell and obtain electricity directly with ethanol. The advantage is that you don't need battery and you can use ethanol as a kind of battery. You see, in the source. And you don't have to change the gas station or soft benefits on that. But there are also some problems. It's still a bit expensive. The requirements are a bit heavy and uh, requires some uh, elements that are not very cheap. So they're still in process. Well, considering our, our journey here, so we can also use this for alcohol chemistry and use it for air transport like alcohol to jet, although there are other fields that are apparently more competitive with alcohol to jet, but it's also a possibility. Well, thinking about these trends and, 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 and thinking that just an exercise uh, uh, about the ethanol market, let's say in 2050 or 2060 with lots of electric vehicles. And then um, I was wondering, can we use ethanol in, in for power generation? Would it, would it make sense to use it for power generation? But then we started to assess this. And there is a, a pioneering uh, case study, which is this thermal power, this relatively small thermal power, is in GSD for the year Rio de Janeiro City. They have a thermal power, a fire, gas fire based thermal power, that they started using the ethanol. Uh, and as a flexible fuel uh, thermal power. So if you don't have ethanol, no problem, you just keep using gas. So this is the tank with the uh, truck uh, with uh, transporting ethanol here. These are the tanks uh, to storage uh, ethanol. It's about uh, 600 cubic meters of uh, ethanol is possible to store there, uh, possible to operate about 30 hours. Uh, this thermal power has approximately 87 uh, megawatts of installed capacity. This is a pump system, and then this is an adaptation of the turbine. You adapt to the turbine and can inject ethanol for or natural gas. This is without CCS. Okay? This is just alternating the fuel. Think, for example, in the situation that some countries are having with the natural gas supply that's in Europe. So have this possibility of having another fuel that you can switch. It's something interesting not only for carbon emission, but also for energy, energy security. Right, so why don't you use ethanol in a combined cycle? This case here that I showed you before, it was a single cycle. This is a single cycle thermal power. Why don't we use a combined cycle and capture the emissions? And in addition to this, why don't we capture the emission from the fermentation process in the biorefinery? Okay. So when we capture this all together, is what we are calling here as ethanol power with carbon capture utilization and storage, EPCCUS. Uh, I'm proposing this with uh, some other colleagues. We are writing a paper. This is a uh, publication process. And uh, with some preliminary analysis, the potential of using ethanol for power generation, but including capture in the power generation and in the fermentation process. Some advantages. This will provide dispatchable electricity, which is one of very complicated areas to discarbonize. This will provide an alternative ethanol market, thinking that Actually, we have a growing share of electric vehicles worldwide. This will provide energy, uh, will increase energy security because then we have the option if we don't have sufficient amount of natural gas or the heavy ethanol, that will be something interesting. The technology basis is already available. So we are not talking about the breakthrough technology that we are still studying. No, we are already producing ethanol. The gas turbines are the same that we have. They are aerodirectative gas turbines. So, uh, that there are some problems here. How about costs? And would we really able to obtain negative emissions? Let's see. So here we put everything together. I'm finishing here. Uh, we put everything together here, the life cycle assessment that we have here, for example, for the ethanol part and the gas part, all the inflows and, 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 and outflows here from carbon. We obtain you know, carbon from the atmosphere here, get our carbon from the atmosphere. We may have some direct land use change, indirect land use change. Then you have the biorefinery process. We can we emit CO2 here, or we can capture here. And then we put this in a thermal power and sequester. Same thing for gas. 
Yes, we may have leakage of methane here. So there are also some issues related to that from yes, left side. Well, we obtain it then as an exercise. Okay. If let's say if we use all ethanol that we have available in the world, all it, and let's say rather than using this as a transport fuel, we are going to use this, let's say by 20 feet or so, we're going to use an equivalent amount, okay, an equivalent amount in, in thermal powers. This would be the reduction. Okay. This is just substituting natural gas without CCS. This is the emission from natural gas equivalent to 5%. And this is using corn, corn capturing emissions in the fermentation process, sugar cane without capturing the emission in the fermentation process, and sugar cane capturing the emission fermentation process. So even without CCS in the thermal power, just capturing the emissions in the fermentation process of sugar cane, we are already able to obtain negative emission. But if we capture in the fermentation and in the power station, when you generate electricity, then all fuels will obtain negative emissions. And this delta here is, is massive because actually we are getting negative and we have these avoided emissions. Well, then we estimate the approximately the length that would be necessary to produce this. Okay, so we assess it here a broad range, uh, considering like a low crop use, high crop use, average crop use. If we do this using only corn, if we do this using only sugar cane, and then uh, this is an estimate for without car uh, capture, carbon capture, the power generation, this the EPCC US, which means with carbon capture. There's an energy penalty here, that's why they are this. And uh, this is harvested area, okay? Just to clarify, because for example, if you have double cropping of corn, you may need less land than this <coughs> physical area. Well, another exercise is, well, how about if we change all the natural gas that we are using for power generation? If we use ethanol, I know that this may sound a bit, a bit uh, extreme exercise, but just to understand the magnitude that would be possible to achieve. Well, then the negative emission will be massive, is minus gigaton of CO2. Remember that the total CO2 emission in the world, CO2 equivalent, is 59. 59, you are obtaining minus four of negative emission, but, but actually we also have 3.36 of avoided emission. So the total here is actually 7.36 gigatons of CO2 avoided plus negative. This is, is huge. Problems. Well, in this exercise, the area will also be massive. If we use only sugar cane, 261, this is approximately uh, the a, a bit, a, approximately the current agricultural land in Brazil, let's say. Uh, the United States is about this is this is uh, a, a, almost the, the size of the United States. Uh, United States, I think, is 950 million acres or so. Is an extreme situation, very low yield, but then this will be something more reasonable here in terms of scale for this extreme exercise, of course. But this is global, okay? This is global, and this is harvested land. So we can have double cropping, these things that we discussed. And we have also by, by products, it's not only fuel, just other things to see. Well, to assess the costs, then we consider the international energy agencies and some scenarios for cost analysis. And then we obtain some graphs here when the PCCOS will be viable or non viable, according to these different curves here. So, for example, in the United States, it's very complicated because in the US, natural gas are very cheap. Okay? But if you, if you look at the prices in Korea and Japan, for example, because they're importing liquefied natural gas. I, I, I checked it uh, actually, I just checked in the, the weekend to see the prices now, and they are huge because um, when you look at the, uh, the plots, uh, Japan, Korea market, for example, uh, in March, there are prices like $80, $80 per million tons. But this is a, a spike, you know, because of speculative behavior. But when you look at the average that we're seeing, it's about 30 in the Korea, uh, Japan uh, market. Even future markets find this. 
So if you say 30, and currently we have about $20 the price of ethanol, well, then we start to, some projects start to make sense. And this is the analysis. You can see that we will need a carbon price of 171, which is very expensive to become, that this technology become viable. But there is a huge dispersion here. In some areas, they may, they may be already competitive, actually. And to finalize, if we think, well, actually, many gas fire power plants, they will have CCUS anyway. No, it's not because you are proposing this in CCUS. Natural gas, some countries are saying that uh, they will mandatorily have to have a carbon capture. Well, in this case, uh, we should compare them ethanol with gas being captured. Okay, so in the end, we we'll obtain the average will not change much, but the dispersion will change, and many places here we will have a competitive um, scenario. So, in conclusion, this nature-based solution they can provide a relevant contribution to carbon mitigation. This, uh, this uh, term solution we have to understand this in a broad context. Of course, this is not only nature-based solution there. Lots of other strategies that are equally important, but they can be substantial. BECs can help obtain negative emissions to offset hard to operate sectors. These technologies that are proposed have no power with carbon capture and storage. They may be already viable in some markets, but still, uh, it's difficult in, 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 in average markets. Main challenges, many use, and few costs. If we are to implement this type of technology, then we would, we would of course have to assess this more deeply. It will require a regulatory framework and social environmental criteria to assess this uh, more deeply. And to finalize this type of assessment, we are not including the costs related to the impacts of climate change and adaptation costs. Because, because it's easy to compare with natural gas. Okay, oh, natural gas actually is very cheap, but because natural gas is not including these costs here of having potential climate change effects, including costs that are not possible to be prescribed or uh, amounted and accounted, such as, for example, uh, loss of the biodiversity. Well, uh, folks, that's it. Thank you very much uh, for your attention, for your attention, and I'm happy to answer some questions. Thank you. Um, we have uh, 16 minutes, uh, and um, Liz is going to keep check of the uh, virtual questions. Remember, that's the bottom of your uh, page there. Just. Uh, at the question and uh, we will uh, uh, provide them. I guess one of my questions is when I look at their estimates of land, uh, the one thing that the whole crisis in Russia and Ukraine have pointed out is you can have a lot of land, but it can be taken away from you too because of civil war. And we're looking at significant increases in grain prices, for example, going into the next six months. Then I add to that all of the water problems and water resources problems around the world that relate to climate. How do you incorporate those two uh, variables uh, in your thinking? Yeah, that's a two very, very important question. And uh, by the way, Henry and I, we had the, it was for me, it was a pleasure to uh, write something together with Henry on uh, energy and water nexus and biofuels. And we assess here the case of the United States, for example, and uh, uh, the production of biofuels requires substantial amount of water. And this is something relevant that we have to take into account, and also the use of fertilizers is also something important. Well, uh, some nations in uh, water scarce areas, I would encourage the expansion of biofuels in these areas. Okay. Um, although, Many fuel crops, they can be simply rain fed. Say, for example, I'm, I'm talking about the reality, for example, my home country. Almost all sugar cane produced in Brazil, they are rain fed. In the United States, states most, most corn are rain fed. Some people think they are actually irrigated. No, actually, it's a small percentage. I think it's 15% or something like that. They are uh, producing using irrigation. So the main actually 
water footprint related to irrigation. In the industrial part, there are also some impacts, but this has been uh, minimized over the years. Industries are managing to use water more efficiently to recycle uh, the water use the same. But at the same time, we have to think that uh, uh, gas fire thermal power also use water. So there's water impacts associated with this other competitive uses as well. Regarding land use and land tenure and this type of conflicts, actually land is a subject that is extremely complex because in some countries, lands are state owned, other countries are private owned. And uh, some countries, they are, they have a kind of clear rules, it's separate, but in reality, you have lots of land grabbing, you have lots of, you know, uh, corruption associated with uh, land resources, so it's not definitely not an easy, an easy topic. But this, this is about agriculture in general. This is not only about biofuels or biomass. It affects everything. Questions? Yes. Thank you, uh, Alessandro, for the talk. <clears throat> I have two small questions. One is regarding. I'm glad you talked about costs. Uh, I wanted to learn a little bit more about. How does it do things look looking forward, uh, given the cost trends that we've seen and the learning rates that we've seen for a lot of technologies, for solar, for batteries, and now projected costs for electrolyzers? Uh, what is the learning potential for uh, the ethanol technologies that you're talking about? So for the EPCC US, what kind of cost reductions can we expect? And the second question is about standardization. Um, I feel like a lot of barriers to achieving scale in countries like India uh, have been related to standardization and setting up of um, supply chains for the feedstock uh, and to be able to do that efficiently so that you can collect the feedstock over a large area and use it in a cost effective manner. Um, so have you thought about how do we achieve the kind of standardization to set up efficient supply chains for some of these technologies which has been an issue since a long time now, I guess. Right, that, that's a really great, actually, both questions really great, thanks, Anisha. And well, uh, the first about other uh, technologies, uh, like solar, the solar, the cost, the learning curve of uh, solar PV, for example, it's amazing to see how uh, quickly it has been uh, uh, declining the costs and wind power as well. Uh, the point is that this type of uh, I want to say proposition is an analysis. Okay, we are just trying to understand if it makes sense or not. It, it's not in competition with uh, wind or solar because this will be important to have a source of dispatchable electricity, right? So rather than using natural gas, we use ethanol. But uh, I would agree that actually, if we look at the costs of uh, electricity generation from wind and solar, it will be much more competitive. The idea is to balance these things. Uh, regarding the use of uh, batteries and smart grids, etc., we may need less and less sources of dispatchable electricity if we have other strategies to uh, balance the grid. Right? In this exercise, we explored some extreme situation just to see the magnitude, but we could have these in niche markets or we could have these like uh, complementing uh, these sources whenever necessary. Regarding the standard issues, uh, when you look at biofuels, it's very complicated when you talk about biodiesel, because biodiesel can be produced from different feedstocks. But ethanol, ethanol is simpler because ethanol is ethylic alcohol. So we just have ethylic alcohol, we have hydros ethanol, unhydros ethanol, which is a very well known in the US and Brazil, other nations, the European Union, even in India and China, other large producing nations. Uh, we have some criteria, uh, standard requirements there, but this is relatively uh, simple. Uh, in terms of feedstock, then uh, this, change, this, this depends on the country. So let's say, for example, our production here is something very traditional. The farmers are used to do this for centuries, actually, uh, for corn production. And corn production for ethanol or for, for MLP is the same corn. It's not a different crop. Sugar again is the same. And as, as you know, India is the 
with Brazil, they are both the largest sugar producer in the world. There's no sugar cane. So if India start to use part of the sugar cane to produce ethanol combined with the sugar, for example, uh, this could generate lots of benefits for farmers, for example, uh, and also uh, for rural areas. Um, and to standardize a bit this, uh, you can have uh, some criteria. So let's say, for example, in the United States, they have, in California, they have the low carbon fuel standard. So the low carbon fuel standard, they have a lots of criteria saying that uh, how these, depending on the way that you produce this uh, ethanol, you have a carbon footprint associated with that. In Brazil, we have a, a program called, uh, it's a, actually it's a federal policy called Renova Bio, in which we have a carbon uh, uh, certification, certificate according to the way that you produce ethanol. So you can say, well, actually I'm trading this, you can trade in exchange market, saying that, well, my ethanol was being produced sustainably, I proved this through external auditing, this type of thing, and then you reduce the impacts. Tougher than I'm not sure, but the question is quite complex, actually. <laughs> Elizabeth, you have one, and then I'm going to back over here. Yeah, we have a question from the Zoom world from David Woolley, uh, who asks, what types of carbon sequestration are available for agricultural lands that don't require the carbon intensive transport of biomass, that is distributed forms of carbon sequestration? Well, I don't know if I got properly the question, but um, um, as I briefly described here in the presentation, there are different maneuvers to increase soil carbon in agriculture. Right? So you can have, for example, no tillage system, increasing soil carbon. This if either using or not using the crop for biofuels, you can increase soil carbon to this type of, of practice. Uh, if you produce biofuels, then it will make sense that people will say, well, I actually would like to double check every step that we're producing because I'm using these biofuels because we are claiming that actually we are going to reduce the emissions. That's fair enough. So then when you start to assess, it will be much better if you have in the agricultural sector, if you increase soil carbon, in the transport, you avoid large transportation, you have like a use to produce the ethanol close to the consumption centers, which is not very Sometimes it's not possible. If you are transporting this ethanol and then you are spending uh, uh, energy and releasing emissions in transport, although ship transport is not very impactful in this sense. Uh, so then you have to check every, every uh, step this uh, carbon footprint. But um, something that is important to understand this carbon dynamics is exactly this logic of uh, several integrated issues. So for example, the use of distillers dry grain, uh, this is very important to understand the carbon dynamics because actually, if I increase soil carbon by no tillage uh, farm production, if I'm using this corn for ethanol, but if I'm also using the other part of corn for other proposals, then I, I start to minimize this impact. And if I capture the CO2 from fermentation, which is unbelievably, we are not doing that except for fuel biorefinery that we're starting to capture that. This CO2 is released. Actually, this CO2, to be honest with you, I personally think that this CO2 is the easiest emission to capture because CO2 from fermentation is more than 99% concentration. So you don't have to use membranes, adsorption, absorption types of carbon capture. This is almost pure CO2 stream. Very easy to capture, easy to use, actually. Another thing is to capture in the exhaustion pipe in the power generation. That is more complicated because you have a low concentration unless you use pure oxygen in the combustion. But that's another story. That's another question. You had a question back here. Yes. Uh, so we, have, we have five minutes, so. All right. Um, are there any, is there any potential that this might lead to deforestation or to farm these biofuels? Yeah. That's, that's a very, very good question. And actually, um, although I, I personally uh, am enthusiast of biofuels and bioenergy, but I'm also critical of this type of uh, risks. And 
you cannot expand agriculture wherever you want. And the same for livestock. So how to balance this? That's an important question. This is not only for biofuels, this is for agriculture and livestock in general. But for biofuels, it's even more critical because you are using this argument of carbon reduction, right? If you are deforesting, it wouldn't make sense. Because if you are deforesting, it means that you are removing all this carbon that is stored in the forest and releasing to the atmosphere. So the payback period to compensate this emission will be huge, will be many, many decades actually, to pay back that carbon. So the important is to increase production by two main ways. One is to increase yields, so if you increase crop yields, you don't need to use that. Second is to use uh, uh, integrated schemes, so then you reduce also the amount of land. Well, we can also explore some of the more radical manners to avoid this situation. For example, you can have zoning schemes. I had the opportunity to coordinate an agroecological zoning for biofuels expansion in Brazil when I worked with the government. We simply say, okay, look, actually, we had some uh, uh, colleagues from a, a research, agricultural research company there called Embrapa. And we uh, had a great team of experts in, in GIS tools and this type of soil analysis, etc. So we map it out the entire country and say, okay, look, in the Amazon, we are forbidden to expand biofuels. In the Pantanal, which is an important swamp land, we are also forbidden. But in these other areas, we are welcome to expand. And then we converted this into a legal framework, and it worked very well. It was launched in 2009. Until recently, no biofuels expansion in Brazil occurred in lands that we excluded, which was really great. I was, it was something that I was proud of. So it was really great when I worked with the government. That project was really great. But then the current president revoked. <laughs> <laughs> and I hope that we have a, a new. Uh, administration next year. But uh, on the other hand, this zone was revoked, but the country started an alternative system, which is basically a certification scheme of carbon balance, etc., which has been working well. Also. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You all. Uh, we Next week will be our uh, final uh, energy policy seminar of the semester, and we have a Real treat for everybody. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, discussion and debate uh, over the year about what's the ro role of oil companies and gas companies going forward. There's a lot of difference of opinion, and they're held very strongly in this institution uh, on that issue. And we're bringing in a person who I think is the best expert in the United States on it, uh, Professor Andrew Hoffman of the University of Michigan, and he will be talking on creative or controlled destruction. The fate of the fossil fuel sector in a climate uh, constrained uh, world. So uh, he will be our final guest and he will be next week. Alexandra, thank you very much. Thank you.